So the topic on the table for today is storytelling. It really is the, the endless and, and ubiquitous topic of what we all think about. And so much of Museums on the Web over 20 years has been about finding the right tool sets to enhance telling of stories for the audiences and communities that we serve. And so, in, in the most ironic of statements, Museums on the Web has never been about the technology. It's always been about what the technology allows us to do. So what we wanted to do was ask Rob Stein, a phenomenal practitioner in our space, a, a great theoretician, and a great challenger of the institutions that he's been in to perform in new ways. Uh, a real uh, avant-garde, uh, agent of change, maven character, to really set the stage. No, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then ask some of our favorite storytellers, Sandy Goldberg and Halsey Begun, to respond to that. Then also to introduce Easy uh, and their platform and their interest in broadening the storytelling capability of our community. And then once we've got all of those ingredients together, add some coffee and allow that mix to bake nicely over uh, the next hour and a half. But then also at the end of that process, to take from this the conversation, the opportunity as a virtual group to move the conversation and the practice forward. Um, and we can talk about what that means uh, as the morning unfolds. So, enough from me, Rob. Thank you, Titus. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, so nice to have you show up this morning. And I hope you're uh, well caffeinated. It's nothing better than starting the morning, I think, with a steaming cup of coffee. But uh, So are you comfortable? Are you ready to go? Um, good. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Thanks for coming out. We are going to talk about storytelling uh, this morning. And hopefully, by the end of the morning, I'll convince you that it's worth your time investing not only in the content that you're sharing, but also the way uh, in which you share it through story uh, that can make uh, an extended difference to your audiences beyond just improving their knowledge, okay? So that's where we're going. Uh, to start, though, I thought we'd tackle a subject um, that, in, in my opinion, is getting more and more important and will be one that we're dealing with uh, as a country, as a society, and as a world uh, over the next several decades, income inequality. Uh, it may seem a funny place to start, but you know we get facts from Oxfam. There's a few of them here in quick succession. 1% of the world's population now owns 46% of the wealth. The 62 richest people in the world own as much as the poorest 50% of people in the world. In the US, a very developed country, right? But child poverty exists at a 20-year high. So it is, it is increasing. Uh, and Oxfam, in their report in 2014 uh, called Working for the Few, says this massive concentration of economic resources in the hands of fewer people presents a significant threat to inclusive political and economic systems. Instead of moving forward together, people are increasingly separated by economic and political power, inevitably heightening social tensions and increasing the risk of societal breakdown. So to continue, I wanted to tell you uh, a little story. Uh, and this is a story based on a work of art in Dallas um, by a French painter named Juroust. Uh, and it's a story about the young woman in the middle. This is Adelaide Bourbon. Uh, she's 14 in this picture, and she's learning how to play the harp. Uh, Adelaide uh, was the fortunate daughter of Philippe Joseph de Bourbon, who was the Duc d'Orléans, okay? The year is uh, 1791. It's the springtime in France. Uh, you could see in the picture that it was green outside. It wasn't cold like it here is here in Boston. They didn't have three feet of snow like they have in D.C. Uh, and uh, Adelaide's father, um, the Duc d'Orléans, was the richest man in France. He was wealthier than the king, 
Uh, King Louis was his cousin, uh, but he lived in the Palais Royal across the Seine uh, and in the uh, next door to the Louvre. So uh, he was a very powerful man, uh, and, uh, and he loved his daughter. Uh, he had uh, a daughter and, and a son. He had a twin sister who died uh, early, uh, but her father doted on Adelaide. And in fact, uh, Adelaide was uh, really privileged uh, at the time. So the other woman in this picture is um, the Madame Jean Lee, uh, and she was renowned as a harp player. She was one of the best harp players uh, in France at the time, and she was Adelaide's tutor. Uh, she was also her father's mistress. <laughs> so as is common in France, but uh, uh, and what you may know, <laughs> what you may know uh, is that in 1791. A lot of other things were happening in France at the same time. Uh, and so uh, Madame Jean Lee, uh, as Adelaide's tutor, was also bringing uh, a lot of social ideas into the salons in France in the late 18th century. Uh, and those salons and the philosophy of, of the social gap that existed between the very wealthy elite in France and the working uh, bourgeoisie uh, were coming into conflict, and so the French Revolution happened uh, as a result, and there's more to say about that. Uh, but what's important to note is that this picture in particular was commissioned by uh, Adelaide's father, the Duc d'Orléans, who, remember, is the, mo is the wealthiest man in France, as a piece of propaganda. So if you'll notice, the, the colors of the, of the flag for the revolution were red, white, and blue, so notice the composition in red, white, and blue. Uh, Adelaide's clothed in white as being innocent, um, and the harps are, are colored in the same way. The statue in the back is of Minerva, who represents freedom, was a symbol of the revolution. Uh, she's wearing a special kind of hat, which was worn, it's called the Phrygian cap, it was worn in the same way by uh, the proponents of the revolution, and she's carrying a pike, uh, which if we go back a couple of slides, is the exact sort of imagery that we see in this picture by Delacroix. So the Duc d'Orléans, her father, was attempting to say that he's a friend of the revolution. Well, it didn't work. Uh, he voted for his cousin's execution. Uh, so that, uh, King Louis was executed uh, at the guillotine. And uh, six weeks later, uh, her father was as well. Um, Adelaide uh, was exiled from France. Uh, she grew up uh, uh, the rest of her time in Switzerland. She never remarried. This is a picture of her much older. Her brother uh, eventually became uh, the king of the French after uh, the fall of Napoleon and the Bourbon Restoration. And it was known or it was said that uh, Adelaide and her brother Philippe uh, remained very close, that she was actually his advisor uh, because she had been so well educated by Madame Jean Lee. Uh, that those social ideals continued to move forward and that she uh, was his closest confidant. So not so long after, Adam Smith, who's the moral philosopher who wrote The Wealth of Nations, said no society can be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of its members are poor and miserable. So what did we do here? We, we went through two different halves, right? And I thank you for abiding by a little bit of storytelling uh, this morning, but it seemed appropriate. And the first set of slides, we just looked at the content, just the facts. And the second set of slides, we really turned towards a, more of a story, something that hopefully you connected with, that gave you a bit of a sense, maybe carried along the meaning of the facts that we looked at in the beginning, but in a way that was a little bit more appealing, or a little bit more transportive. So why should stories matter in the cultural sector? That's really what we're talking about this morning. Uh, many of you may have seen the culture track studies from uh, LaPlaca Cohen. Uh, Arthur Cohen and his team have been uh, doing this for a number of years, and these are results that were released uh, summarizing the state in 2014. And in those, uh, we look at reasons to make culture part of your life. And I want to draw your attention to the three to the far left, the tallest bars. They are entertainment and enjoyment, uh, time with your friends and family, and to expand your perspective, okay? These are all the sorts of things that we can accomplish through storytelling, but it's really interesting to note uh, that when they talk about culture in this survey, what the public is thinking of as a cultural experience. 
So 56 uh, define going to a film at the theater, uh, a cultural experience, and half of those people actually did that in the prior year. 64% define going out for good food and drink uh, as a cultural experience in, in the survey, and 73% participated with that. Uh, and 51% describe watching non-commercial television, probably a certain show uh, uh, that we can all uh, and, uh, remember, and 84% uh, report actually participating in that activity. Um, so, so those are really interesting, those are really interesting forms of culture, right? Uh, it's not really that uh, I'm going to, only that I'm going to the museum, I'm going to the opera, I'm going to the symphony. No, it's I'm having a great meal with my friends. Uh, I'm sitting down and watching Downton Abbey together, uh, or whatever it is. So many of you are familiar with this story arc. This is how Kurt Vonnegut uh, describes drama. Uh, but it has very uh, similar components to all stories that we, we see. There's a setup, there's a rising tension, there's climax at the top, uh, there's some denouement at the end, right? And at the end, the prince finds her and they live happily ever after. A very familiar story. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, illustrated what he called the hero's journey in that he analyzed the myths and uh, uh, popular stories uh, and epic stories and, and witnessed that many of them follow exactly the same path over and over again. Stories are encoded in the way we think about our world and our culture. Uh, and so what can we do that really leverages that and takes advantage of that? Stories are a familiar way uh, that we can communicate and connect to people who are different than we are. Uh, they're vessels that carry culture along, right? Before the printed page, uh, storytelling was the tool that we used to embody what we thought as a culture was important to preserve. Stories, like we shared this morning, whoops, look at that. Stories can carry uh, emotion and aesthetics and meaning along with content and information. So you learned a little bit about the French Revolution this morning, uh, but also uh, Adelaide is a tragic character, right? And so you wonder what actually happened in those intervening periods for Adelaide. Stories can help us address topics that are difficult or ambiguous. Income inequality is a terribly difficult subject that we're gonna have to deal with as a society. Storytelling, I believe, is one way that we can convey the emotion, not just the facts, about why it matters. And stories help build empathy. And I'm saying this, uh, and actually, as I was doing a little bit of research, I found scientific backup for this. There's a, uh, there's a professor from the Claremont Graduate University named Paul Zak, and he's a neuroscientist and a chemist. Uh, and so he has been studying what happens when people uh, are in the presence of uh, a great story, right? When you feel your heart begin to quicken and pound, you produce oxytocin. Uh, and he found that character-driven stories consistently cause people to produce this chemical called oxytocin. And uh, what I learned is that oxytocin is the, is the chemical in the brain that's produced when you feel trusted or when you're shown a kindness. It was originally discovered as mothers were nursing their babies, right? So it's that sort of feeling. It motivates you towards cooperation with other people, and it does this by enhancing your sense of empathy and your ability to relate or connect or experience the emotion of other people. This is all from his study, and I'd encourage you to read Paul Zach's work. He has a great TED Talk on the subject as well. Uh, but the, the point is, and we won't read all of this, that storytelling actually makes you more receptive to empathy and more likely to connect with someone who's different from you. This seems like a tremendous tool that we should be able to use in the cultural sector. But why is it important to think about this now? Uh, why now, why not yesterday? Stories have been around for a thousand years. What's different today? Uh, so many of you will uh, remember uh, a period between 2004 and 2006 when social media really started to explode, right? And, and today, uh, I would gather that there's uh, hardly any of you in the room that represent museums or organizations that aren't thinking about social media in some form or fashion. It wasn't that uh, prior to social media, it wasn't that it was impossible for the public to share their thoughts online, it's just that during this explosion there was a critical mass of 
uh, technologies and tools that made it easy, and the people who uh, caught the idea of why it could be important to be able to rate and comment and uh, form networks that expand your personal circles. So today, uh, we, this is just a snapshot from Mar Dixon's great museum selfie work of, uh, what was it, two weeks ago was museum selfie day? Uh, the epitome of social media in the cultural sector, but I wanna draw your uh, attention to the number on the far right, which is the reach in numbers of people that this idea of museum selfie had generated. It was 95 and a half million people participated or were reached in some way by this social media. Uh, so what's happening today uh, that's similar in the realm of storytelling? Uh, it may seem like an odd connection, but think about, uh, think about it. If you were on your phone today, you could, uh, within one hour, order just about anything on the planet and have it delivered to this hotel, right? You can have people pick it up for you. Amazon may deliver it in a drone. Uh, who knows? But uh, what is the effect that this actually having on brick and mortar retail, right? You're beginning to see this. But uh, we've talked about the experience economy a lot, but this instant gratification of online shopping is causing bricks and mortar stores to focus on the experience of being in the store. So this is a, a picture of the REI headquarters, right? So if you're REI, I can order anything from REI and have it delivered to this hotel before I'm done talking, right? But if I go to the store, I can learn how to rock climb and I can catch the vision for what it's like to maybe visit Yosemite. And boy, I need a lot of gear to go visit Yosemite. Uh, so the retail sector is really adopting this. Uh, anthropology is another great example of a clothing retailer who takes the experience of shopping in their store far beyond what you would get just ordering it on your phone, right? So it's becoming very common for the public to get used to the idea that experience is a part of their daily routine. So drones and virtual reality. How many of you are aware of this Oculus Rift thing? Okay, everybody. How many of you have had a chance to try on one of these headsets? All right, so I'm proposing that we're actually in an age of uh, virtual reality is hitting the gestalt or the zeitgeist, right? It's in people's minds and it's coming through media and uh, the New York Times is shipping the Google Cardboard to uh, people who are subscribers, right? So it's now very cheap and it's everywhere. Uh, that's my gig before I was in museums. I, my job was to build virtual reality environments. And it used to look like this. This is my friend Albert standing in a cave that we built with wires hanging off of his head. Used to be that uh, Rachel is here with the, this helmet that is an pr early precursor to the Oculus Rift. And even before that, we used what were called booms, right? They were too heavy to actually wear it on your head, so you'd have to look around. So today, uh, we have these things you can wear on your head, uh, and it was hilarious. Apparently, there's a, there's a common way to use them. You have to put them on your head and open your mouth and look up, <laughs> and sometimes you can reach out. Uh, but it's, it's a fairly consistent meme as you find virtual reality, right? But, so I'm proposing that VR is becoming an expectation, and it's not that the technology is the expectation, it's that experience and immersion is the expectation that the public is bringing with them. So this is uh, some work that Sarah Kennerdine uh, had done in the Donghua Caves in China, and she was able to then recreate these caves, which are very delicate and they're very difficult to visit. She used virtual reality as a way to immerse people into the cave and be able to reproduce it. So what, uh, what kind of experiences are possible in museums and in cultural sectors that would satisfy this urge that the public uh, is, I think, burgeoning towards for uh, an experience and a story to go along with their content? Uh, it's going to be, in my opinion, just like social media, where before 2004, nobody knew that they should want to be able to comment online. And today, nobody could imagine not being able to comment online. I think story and experience are in the, same, in the same vein. So let's talk a little bit about storytelling in the museum and coffee. Um, but let's talk about what it's like 
uh, to tell stories in the museum and what are some of the unique challenges. Halsey and Sandy and Titus are gonna join us in a little bit for conversation about this. But uh, generally, you would think about it like this. Uh, this is a fairly simple way to do this. If you were building uh, an audio tour or a self-guided tour or maybe just a pamphlet, right, you would tend to author it in a very linear fashion. You have plot points, you can follow a narrative arc, and it's all very nice and tidy. But what happens in the actual museum is that you are trying to tell very many stories all at the same time. So at best, it looks a little bit like this, which amounts to kind of a choose-your-own-adventure style look to it, right? But this gets a little bit harder to then carry the story through and make it all hold together, right? So that's why I think it's difficult in museums to, for the general visitor, tell them a story that makes sense from beginning to end. In reality, this is really what the museum looks like, is that there are thousands of ways that you can go, and it's actually very difficult for the museum as a content producer to tell a story that makes sense when we don't actually know how the visitor will encounter it, right? And I think we're finally at the point where technology can help us address this. But let's, uh, let's go a little bit deeper. So this is a problem we ran into when I was at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. That museum has a great collection of neo-impressionist works, and this is a panorama of the neo-impressionist gallery, right? And you can see it's very open, and there's some great works of art, in particular uh, by Emile Bernard and Paul Gauguin. So here's some works uh, by Bernard on the left and Gauguin on the right. Uh, but as you enter this gallery, it's very hard to know uh, what information you've already encountered or not, because you could approach any one of these first, right? So when do I tell you uh, that Gauguin and Bernard, Gauguin on the right, Bernard on the left, were actually friends, uh, that they influenced each other. Bernard was the younger, Gauguin was the older. Uh, Bernard always felt that his work had influenced a lot of Gauguin's later work. Gauguin never admitted this. Uh, this made Bernard upset, right, and frustrated that Gauguin uh, didn't recognize uh, how important his work was. Uh, when do you tell that part of the story? When you encounter the first painting or the last painting? When do you share a little bit more about pont -Aven, right? This is called the pont School. Uh, pont is in uh, northwest France uh, along the coast um, and is a very beautiful spot. There's a picture from pont today. You can see how it inspired these painters to do their work uh, and, in fact, uh, inspired other things. So Gauguin fell in love uh, with Bernard's sister. Uh, so these are portraits of Bernard's sister uh, on the left, uh, painted by her brother, Emile, and on the right, painted by Gauguin. Look at how different she looks between the two. On the left, she's innocent and dour, and on the right, she has sort of these cat eyes, right? And she's looking at you askance. Uh, and her, uh, Gauguin's love was unrequited. Uh, she actually married uh, a man named Laval, uh, who was also in pont at the time. Gauguin sort of never recovered. He went to Tahiti. He did fine. <laughs> But how do you tell that story, and, and how does it uh, connect for the public, right? Um, well, we have this problem, right? Other, other spaces have this problem. This is a screenshot from a game called Assassin's Creed, uh, and it's uh, representing 1860s Paris. Uh, and for those of you that know Paris, you'll recognize uh, Notre Dame in the background on the right and Saint-Chapelle. Uh, in the foreground on the left. And so I had this experience of visiting uh, Paris this summer with my family. My kids are 18 and 16, both boys. They love this game. And when we showed up in France, uh, we were on Ile Saint-Louis. They actually knew where they were. They'd never been to Paris before, but they had played this game, and they, the architecture was realistic enough that they knew where they were, and they knew how to get around even before they'd set foot there. So this is a game where you have an awful lot of control. And just like a museum gallery, you can choose to do uh, whatever task in whatever order, but the game funnels you into experiences that tells you what feels like a very compelling and contain, uh, contained story. Uh, and this is called generative storytelling, right? So we have the ability now in technology and tools to know the context of a user and their visit. We should be able to use that context to tell the story about Gauguin and Bernard, 
to you in whatever order you choose to encounter it. And I should know uh, when you've already heard the part about Bernard's sister and when you haven't. And I may even know when the opportune time to tell you about that is. Uh, there's some research by a guy named Mark Rydell at Georgia Institute of Technology on generative storytelling. And this is a graph of the famous story of Aladdin and the genie and the lamp, right? So made into a Disney movie, but also uh, mythology. Uh, and, and this story uh, is told in many different ways. You read it five different times, you'll read it in five different ways. But the important point is that uh, Aladdin falls in love, the genie is uh, in some cases defeated, and this is a graph that says what are the important plot points to consider as somebody makes their way through the story. So maybe in museums, the key is setting up what these plot points are. What, are. what are the important things you need to know, and how can I steer your experience through them, just like this. So I think there are a number of other challenges, and uh, I hope that Titus and Halsey and uh, Sandy and I can get into talking about that a little bit. Uh, I think it'd be useful for museums to consider their complicated relationship with fiction. Okay? <laughs> We have no problem telling myths and mythology. Uh, some people will say we create our own fictions in the gallery. Uh, it's the truth of what goes on the wall in the museum is sometimes fairly arbitrary. Uh, so that in itself is a fiction. Uh, there, in my opinion, there are not enough storytellers in our field. Uh, it is a special art and a skill, and we honor art and skill uh, in our field, but we don't employ storytellers. Uh, our buildings are poorly designed for immersive experiences right now. They're great for the white box experience, uh, but they're really poorly designed to accommodate a more immersive, more environmental, story-oriented experience. Uh, we lack tools to manage nonlinear stories. Uh, if I said, it's great to say, well, let's build Assassin's Creed for the museum, and a whole other thing to actually do that, right? We lack those tools right now. Uh, and we've created unnecessary barriers between distinctions of cultural uh, performing arts and the visual arts, right? We have a whole cadre of uh, collaborators and pioneers just waiting for us in the performing arts sector who have figured out narrative and storytelling and immersion and suspending your disbelief, and they can help us, but we've created these arbitrary barriers between the two. So, anyways. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate the chance to come here and for the coffee. Uh, and I hope we can have a good discussion uh, with everybody. Uh, but anyways, thanks so much. Wonderful starting point. Um, we, we're a little light on microphones, so I'm going to shout. Um, I'd like Sandy and Halsey to come up really Imagine this is a big plenary space and they're going to be on stage and it's, it's got lots of cameras and um, what we wanted to do before we open up to a, a really open conversation is allow some responses to that. Um, Rob has presented really interesting data and information and examples and also some challenges and uh, as I said at the beginning, we really wanted to get perspectives on some professional storytellers. Um, before we open it up to the fact that in essence we're all storytellers in the roles that we play in the institutions we work for, but also in our own journeys through culture as experienced servers. So, Sandy. Hi. <laughs> so I was madly taking notes because I saw Rob's slides ahead of time, but of course they were not annotated. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of guessing what he was going to be talking about. But I wanted to throw out an idea um, to sort of respond. First of all, is that most of the storytelling you refer to in museums was about the things. And I would challenge you to say that the story doesn't necessarily have to be about the things. The story can be about people's response, or in the first example you gave of the income inequality, mm -hmm. that story. Um, not to go into too much, but I recently did a project for Baltimore, in fact, was very inspiring because I did films in impoverished homes right after the uprising about ideas that are in artworks that people lived with that the museum had loaned them. And it wasn't about the things. It was about the meaning. And I know that we know that people report that they go to museums to not necessarily be taught about the things. I think that's what, what the, what's museum wants to tell them, 
but they're going for a meaningful, emotional, and aesthetic experience. And telling them about the things doesn't necessarily do that. It adds to that. But I would say that we can think of stories as a container for what little pieces of it that you learn about that then tap into people's lives and their experience and help them generate stories that are meaningful in ways that are not traditionally interpretive for the museum. And that makes me throw out the idea, is a personal experience, as a personal response, is that a story? We, maybe we should think about that. So, um, You know, uh, I'll just interject to that. Your comment makes me think of uh, some work out of the Smithsonian. Uh, it's Andy Picard and Barbara Mogul and Zahava Daring have studied, uh, they're at the Office of Policy and Analysis at the Smithsonian, which sounds like a very interesting office. Uh, but they've studied how people prefer to encounter uh, exhibitions, right? And what they came down to was very similar to what you said. They have a model called uh, IPOP, right? Which is that people are predisposed to care about stories that are about objects, about ideas, and about people, right? And that generally, uh, your you as a person will be predisposed to care about how a thing is made, or the people behind the object or the idea behind the object and that all three of those things are really common sort of memes in their exhibitions. And we know that people also very often consider going to a museum a social experience. And I would argue that storytelling from the beginning of what storytelling was in human history was a social experience. It wasn't me just telling you, it was me talking in a group and us sharing in a group. So I think storytelling in the museum could encourage a social experience in the museum. That I would say that the, we could throw out ideas for how stories that are created, you know, in video form or in other, um, you know, highly aesthetic ways, can be set in the museum. Not so it's one on one. Not so that I'm just looking at it on my phone, but rather create a space, create a lunchtime conversation for people that are at the museum by themselves create areas where something happens in the gallery. So as you were saying, like in the stores, people are going there for an experience. So um, that's something that I would be excited to see also. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, just last week I was having dinner with somebody who told me that they wanted here in town to go to see the moth. You know, we probably all know what the moth is, a storytelling series. I was flabbergasted because she said she couldn't get in because all the tickets sold out in 12 minutes. Now that's just somebody standing up there and telling a story. But the difference is you're telling a story in a group setting. You could just watch it online, you could just hear it, but it's not the same. You, we want those experiences together. So I think the museum can foster that. Not you know having the storyteller telling a story in the gallery, but there are ways for people to be involved in the creation of the story. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time, but the last um, point that I wanted to say is that um, when you were talking about sharing content, I think that's a great thing for the future. But there's the stumble that I see from your last slide when you're asking for uh, barriers. The, a real concrete, incredibly boring stumble in sharing content is copyright. Because there are so many complicated things. Wah, wah, wah. Need, Eve, I'm sorry. <laughs> wah, wah. I need the sad trombone sound effect. But um, we need to think about how, not just with contemporary artists or whatever, but there are ways. Of, it's not even that the museum is holding on to the copyright, but the museum is dealing with sharing things because of those issues. So um, I have some other things, but I'm going to pause it. Thank you. Uh, so Sandy, you actually uh, segued, I think, a little bit nicely into some of my work. I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm not a person who works for a museum to create uh, curatorial experiences or whatnot. I'm somebody who focuses mainly on aesthetic experiences. I'm an audio artist, and I, I, uh, I work a lot with um, spoken voices that I collect from museum visitors. So uh, I, in a, in a very significant way, can, uh, create stories, but they're not entirely a story that I tell. They're a story that I create an infrastructure for it to sort of emerge. And the people who come into the museum, um, I create situations where they can make their own commentary, they can react to things, they can react to each other, they can react to people who have um, been in that place 
previously to them and, um, and sort of create, uh, collectively create what I would consider to be a story. My definitions are a bit more obtuse, I think, than a lot of other people. I'm afforded that ability as, a, as an artist. It's very nice. Um, but I just wanted to sort of throw out the idea of you know, collective storytelling, sort of giving people um, who visit the, uh, the museum um, or another cultural institution the ability to sort of jump in almost directly. So not, not, not necessarily just jumping in in the sense of experiencing an immersive thing, but actually leaving some of themselves behind, leaving a, you know, breadcrumbs of sorts that they can, uh, that they can take some ownership of and, and sort of have, um, <clears throat> Have a, have a you know sort of feel as though they've made a contribution to the museum and their uh, you know people who visit the museum thereafter and it, it sort of enforces the idea of of you know who's the expert like I'm I'm an artist I'm supposed to be creating these art pieces and, and you sort of think of the painter who paints everything and has full control over what's happening but in my case I actually you know create an infrastructure and um, allow other people to kind of fill in a lot of the stuff that I have no idea what it's going to be. And that's incredibly uh, nerve-wracking on day one when I open a piece when there's like nothing in it. There's music and whatnot, but there's no actual content, so to speak. But allowing other people to sort of add and jump in is something that's really, really important to me. And I think it, 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 it sort of makes it very clear that I am not the expert. I am not the person who is um, dictating everything, and, and and to me, when I go to a museum and I have a and I and I have everything dictated to me, I feel very, very upset, and um, <laughs> and I leave, and I. So that's I like all the time. <laughs> I stop. Well, I didn't want to offend anybody, but uh, but I'm um, sure. Uh, yes. So you know, I think there is something about you know who is the who is the expert and what, what are the ways of sort of encouraging a, um, a more sort of leveling of the playing field between who can contribute to this stuff, who can, who can make, um, make the experience of, of the museum a more um, you know, interesting, immersive, story-filled kind of place. And that's, you know, that's what a lot of my you know, work focuses on, whether it's taking museum, sometimes I take museum artifacts and sort of create Fictions, you know, Rob talked about fiction, um, museums complicated in relationship with fiction. That is absolutely true. I definitely um, uh, have experienced a lot of that in my uh, in my day. And I think I think fiction is something that should be embraced a little more. And again, I realize as an artist, I'm able to, you know, my job almost is to create fictions of some sort, and it's easier to get away with it in that case. But um, it's always nice when museums have a little more willingness to, um, you know, to dive into that. And I think it's much easier to um, when you're working with an artist to sort of accept some fictions and accept a little more breadth in, uh, in, in the kind of um, experiences you're creating. I, I, I work both with museums in terms of um, uh, them commissioning me to create artistic projects, but I also work with them sometimes to deploy the same technology that I use for my artwork for more educational purposes. And the difference between those two experiences is, is pretty amazing in the sense that when it's an educational project, there's, there's a totally different mindset that the museum has, and, it, and therefore a totally different mindset that I think the people who are coming to the museum have when experiencing it. They think it's sort of an official thing. They're less willing to jump into it. They're um, sometimes, um, you know, the expectations are set that they will learn facts and whatnot. But when it's an art project, people come into it with a vastly different sort of opinion uh, or, or mindset, I should say, of, you know, what... I don't know what I'm going to experience. I'm going to have this kind of more open situation, and and I would argue that they end up maybe even learning more, um, and maybe even taking away um, even more facts, possibly, <laughs> um, which which to me is um, you know pretty interesting and exciting. And I probably there's probably somebody telling me to stop right now, so <laughs> I will uh, I will leave you with that sort of vague mass of thoughts. But um, I look forward to commenting more. Titus, am I supposed to hand this to you now? We're doing the. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it. So we we, we were talking about this as the lab dance. Uh, oh, that's down. terrible. It's, it's terrible, which made me say. Um, so I will will add two or three observations, not necessarily joined, but inspired by the, the comments made so far. The first is I think there's a very interesting tension for cultural institutions between the need to present some opinion of truth, um, that the institution is not only the protector of the objects or the 
artifact that, that makes that institution, but also of some real story. And you, you can hear the, the scare quotes in, in the way I say that. But at the same time, trying to create a space in which its visitors feel that their opinion and their version of events is as valid. And what's fascinating in terms of Rob's opening comment about uh, the wealth gap is that one of the biggest challenges I think we face in the cultural sector is making a large enough sector of our population feel welcome in museums. There's very often a sense, and we, we talk about it in various communities, but Baltimore is, is front of mind, uh, partly because I'm on the, the edges of, of Baltimore geographically, but also uh, my partner Nancy Proctor is the deputy director at the Baltimore Museum of Art and lived this experience uh, very vividly in the last few months, that when the situation in Baltimore became so tense, the museum's response was to close its doors. And there was a very, very powerful conversation that happened before that decision was made about, is that the right thing to do? And I, I'm not here to comment on whether it was the right or wrong decision, but to sympathize with the challenge of that decision and, and that it had to be made. And what was decided ultimately was that their, their stewardship of objects was more important ultimately if there was any sense of risk than opening itself to the community it was trying to support. One example of many, and, and perhaps a very extreme one for, for effect. What I also noticed in my time working in uh, the audio tour and multimedia tour industry was that we endlessly aspired in the early thousands to random access, giving everybody their own experience of a museum visit or a cultural visit. And very often people were as alienated by that choice as they were by the sense of the museum as, uh, as temple. And very often it was our ability as storytellers to curate their experience that made them feel, quote unquote, at home. So that's a very difficult balance to, to, to strike as well between a voice of authority and bringing you in, triggering that oxycotton, oxycetylene, oxy oxytocin. <laughs> no, that would be, yeah, I was gonna say, I, I don't think we're arc lighting this, but. Um, <laughs> We, we, we want to trigger that empathy and make people feel welcomed and safe. And then they can begin to explore their own opinion, their own ideas of, of what, what they see or experience. Sorry. 